we'll yeah. get running we'll get running now um thanks everyone for coming uh my name's Lachlan Good I'm calling to you from Wallamadigal land here in uh sort of the, the the upper west of Sydney um I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we all joined from you're welcome to chuck them in the chat if you'd like and particularly the contributions that First Nations activists have made to anti-nuclear advocacy over the years um, and the importance of First Nations people around the world in that struggle. Um, uh, as I say, my name's Lachlan. I'm a member of Ride Branch. I'm a campaigner for ICANN at the moment, uh, but I'm also uh, the Vice President of New South Wales Young Labor uh, and a very proud branch activist from the ALP. Uh, and as most people here would be familiar, uh, ICANN has been very invested in the last few months in undertaking campaign work within and around the Labor Party and the structures uh, to ensure that there is awareness and enthusiasm around uh, Labor's existing commitment to ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, should we win government this year. And particularly, we've been very interested in pushing, along with interested branch members, Labor doing so in the first term of its new government should we win in May. Uh, and so we've assembled this panel tonight uh, in order to sort of cultivate some of that uh, excitement and brief members and branch activists who've been particularly involved in how we might escalate that further in the next few months. Um, and we're joined tonight by three really wonderful and amazing panelists um, who I might just ask to introduce themselves in a second, but briefly, uh, we're joined by Robert Tignaio, uh, former minister in the Rudd and Hawke governments uh, and ambassador for ICANN Australia. Uh, we're joined by Melissa Park, also an ambassador for ICANN Australia and a former minister in the Rudd government and senior, senior lawyer for the United Nations. Uh, and Tim Wright, ICANN's current, uh, ICANN Australia's current treaty coordinator, uh, who's worked a lot on uh, over the years, bringing about the circumstances by which the treaty has come into force. So uh, it's a really exciting panel. I've got a bunch of questions, and I'm sure members uh, may have some of their own questions. If you have questions for any of our panellists tonight, uh, just stick them in the chat, and I'll incorporate those into the discussion so that we can keep things moving. But uh, I've got a number of questions that uh, I've developed based on the conversations that I've been having with Labor members uh, in the past few months, basically. So I think the questions we have will probably address a lot of your interests and concerns, but please do chuck them in the chat um, so we can incorporate those or add those. And at the very end, in the last 10 or 15 minutes, we should have time to brief people a little bit on next steps of the campaign, the practical things we can do to keep this a live question and make this an easy win for a, a future Labor government. Um, so yeah, uh, we might get started. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to quickly ask each of the panelists to um, introduce themselves a little bit, in particular, how they uh, have come to uh, become passionate about uh, the, the treaty and uh, nuclear weapons advocacy in general. Um, might just start with uh, Tim. Um, I thought your introduction was adequate, um, Lachlan, but uh, just to add, I, I've been uh, involved in ICANN since it started in uh, 2007. Um, it's, a, it's a job and it's a passion of mine and uh, it's been really um, a, a great privilege to be part of this process of getting the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons adopted at the UN and then brought into force last year um, and then the the next uh, big step that I'm looking forward to is of course uh, getting Australia on board and that's what we're we're here to talk about tonight. Wonderful. Um, and uh, Mel? Oh, yes. Hello. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded Wajak Noongar Buja, um, and I want to pay respects to, to their elders, past and present, and to First Nations elders all over Australia, um, and acknowledge the very deep connection to land and the environment um, that's been nurtured by our First Australians for tens of thousands of years, and the very different, some might say, broken relationship between non-Indigenous humanity and nature. And I think we've seen, we see this broken relationship in, in the bushfires, in uh, unsustainable land practices, um, in action on climate change, uh, pandemics like COVID, and we also see it in nuclear, nuclear, um, nuclear power gone wrong and, and in the development, testing, possession and use of nuclear weapons. Um, I am a great, I was a great um, fan of Tommy Wren, the late great Tommy Wren. Um, and Tommy Wren, as most of you would know, was a member of parliament for 32 years, served as a minister in the Whitlam and Hawke Labor governments. He's a passionate 
anti-nuclear and peace activist. And he had been a prisoner of war of the Japanese at the Omuta camp located 80 kilometers from Nagasaki, where he witnessed the second US uh, atomic bombing. And he said, I will never forget as long as I live the color of the sky on the day the Americans dropped the atomic bomb in that city on 9, 9 August, 1945, the sky was crimson. And when he returned to Japan 15 years later, he witnessed the ongoing devastation in Nagasaki. Now, I, unlike Tommy Wren, I have not witnessed an atomic bomb, but when I worked with the United Nations, I witnessed the deployment of de depleted uranium in Kosovo and the killing of civilians and the bombing of schools, hospitals and homes in Gaza. And one of the, um, one of the most memorable experiences of my life was attending a ceremony at, Ga at the harbour in Gaza City one evening in early August 2002 uh, to commemorate the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, school children in Gaza had prepared hundreds of little paper boats with candles in them. And as the sun went down, um, they lit the candles and set the boats afloat in the harbour. It was really beautiful, it was moving. Uh, it was quite extraordinary that children who were themselves being subjected to a daily uh, nightly bombing campaign were remembering children in another time and place who'd been bombed. Um, and if they can transform that kind of past, present and potential devastation into a message of love, light and peace, I think we also have that responsibility and certainly that is what ICANN's work is all about and why I'm proud to be an ICANN ambassador. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Mel. Um, and Robert. Hi there. Um, yes, I was in the Hawke <laughs> and Pee governments um, as Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Um, my involvement with this issue um, started when I was 17 um, as a student in Taree High School on the north coast of New South Wales. And I've maintained the interest uh, pretty much all my life. Um, I had the privilege later in my life to uh, head up Australian Red Cross for 10 years and together with my colleagues in uh, Australian Red Cross, in particular Helen Durham, who now works for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, we were privileged to be in a position to be able to be the leading Red Cross or Red Crescent National Society um, in the entire world that showed the, I guess, uh, some key leadership on this issue. Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross, led by Dr. Kellenberger, uh, made a major, major public statement in 2009, which then spurned a huge amount of interest in the issue from the International Red Cross, and we'll come to that later. Um, when I finished all my work in Red Cross in Australia and internationally, uh, I was very honoured to be asked to be an ICANN ambassador. Um, and uh, I was also, of course, deeply influenced by the late Tommy Wren, who was a long-standing personal uh, friend of mine. Um, so um, I guess uh, like uh, um, Anthony Albanese and many other people, um, Tom's legacy, uh, strength of character, integrity, and commitment to this issue uh, inspired so many. Wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll get into the questions now. Uh, and it is quite a technical sort of uh, and compelling issue, uh, but it's probably, so it's probably worth starting with just kind of a general briefing on the treaty and particularly uh, ICANN's you know, sort of its origins and, and ICANN's role in advocating for it. I know it's an extensive history, but just a, I'm interested if Tim, you could give us just a general overview of um, maybe why it's different to the non-proliferation treaty and, and what its main sort of uh, uh, sort of purposes. Okay, I can do that. Um, I mean, in a in a nutshell, we um, as I said, we we launched ICANN in two thousand and seven, and at that time, um, there were treaties in place that prohibited chemical weapons, biological weapons, and landmines. Um, there was also a process that was just getting underway to uh, prohibit cluster munitions, but there was no global pro prohibition in place uh, for the very worst weapons of all, nuclear weapons. Uh, and so we uh, built our campaign and uh, spread this message around the world that a new treaty was needed to uh, make nuclear weapons clearly illegal under international law 
and to provide a framework for eliminating nuclear weapon programs. Um, we argued that such a, a treaty should be negotiated even if the nuclear armed countries, the nine countries that have these weapons, uh, refuse to participate in the negotiations. Uh, of course, these countries have um, for decades refused to uh, commit to legally binding obligations for disarmament. Um, and when they have made political commitments to pursue disarmament, uh, generally those commitments haven't been honoured. And so we knew um, that, uh, that they wouldn't embrace this idea of a new um, global ban on nuclear weapons, but we wanted to pers persuade the rest of the international community um, that it was important to um, go ahead and, and negotiate such a treaty. Uh, and that was based on the belief that, uh, that by putting in place uh, this new piece of international law, we would create a lot of pressure and momentum for disarmament um, and that it would change the global public understanding um, of nuclear weapons. Uh, where um, people everywhere would start to view these weapons as uh, unacceptable for all. Um, and in that respect, the, you know, the treaty that was adopted in 2017, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, is very different from the earlier uh, non-proliferation treaty of, of 1968, uh, which didn't establish a, a comprehensive ban on nuclear weapons and which uh, five countries under that treaty that have nuclear weapons which happen to be the, the permanent five members of the Security Council, uh, perceive it as their right to possess nuclear weapons uh, indefinitely. Um, so uh, this new treaty establishes the same standard for all countries and makes it clear that, um, that the weapons are illegal to use, to produce and to possess, um, and creates a, a, an obligation to eliminate them um, in a time-bound manner. Um, so 122 countries supported the adoption of the treaty uh, in 2017. It then entered into force uh, last year after 50 countries had ratified it. Um, to date, there are 59 ratifications and uh, 86 signatures. Um, and we're, uh, every month or so, uh, we're getting new ratifications for the treaty. So we expect that that number will um, keep going up. And the goal is, universal adherence, getting every single country uh, in the world on board. Uh, we know that this is a, a long-term project, um, as with any new uh, norm of international uh, law, it doesn't begin with uh, universal support, it needs to be built up over time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the Australian government, of course, uh, hasn't supported this treaty, but um, as you mentioned at the beginning, Lachlan, we, we have a real opportunity under a future Labor government to bring Australia on board. Um, and Labor was very clear in 2018 at its national conference that uh, it will sign and ratify the treaty when it forms government. Um, and um, that commitment was reaffirmed uh, at the national conference last year. Um, and it was, in fact, Albanese who uh, put forward the proposal back in 2018 before he was leader. Uh, and when it was adopted, he said that that was Labor at its best. Uh, so there's very um, strong support, uh, I think, within the Labor Party um, at, the, at the highest levels. Um, there are, I think, currently 78% of federal Labor parliamentarians who have signed our pledge saying that they will work to get Australia on board the treaty. Um, and you know, there's so much uh, uh, national support, public support, and, and, and that's been um, evidenced by uh, successive opinion polls. Very few people uh, in Australia support the current uh, government's position, just a few percentage um, of people. And um, we have many large organisations, not just, not just Australian Red Cross, but also um, the Australian Medical Association, Australian Conservation Foundation. Um, many of the churches have all voiced their support for the, the treaty and have been very active in, in calling on uh, Australia to join it. So I think there's a very clear um, public mandate to, um, to, to get on board and, and there's that political commitment from Labor. So um, we look forward to 
Australia becoming a, a state party before too long. Wonderful. Um, on this theme of public support, uh, it's true that the success of polls show an overwhelming number of Australians and, and supporters in other countries support not possessing or using or threatening to use nuclear weapons. And yet the general public is often chastened for, uh, you know, this is some kind of naive position. It's a broad question, but in simple terms, I'm interested in asking each of the panellists, why is it that you think that the possession of nuclear weapons presents such a threat to global peace and security? Um, I might start with Mel. No, oh, thanks, Lachlan. Um, I think the very existence of nuclear weapons is an affront to nature. It is a moral injury. Um, the devastation, both human and environmental, that's seen in Japan in 1945 and afterwards, demonstrated conclusively that humanity and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. Um, uh, I'm sure everyone here um, who grew up in the second half of the 20th century at least uh, would vividly recall the common childhood nightmare of nuclear annihilation. Uh, when the Cold War ended, uh, the issue seemed to drop off the public radar. But the terrible irony is that the threat posed by nuclear weapons is far greater today than it was then, not only due to the increased deadliness of the weapons themselves, but also due to their proliferation, including under unstable governments and the added risk of them falling into terrorist hands. Uh, the fact is that nuclear weapons, like climate change, are existential risks to life and the planet that have to be immediately addressed. Yeah, I think uh, well, this has picked up uh, a number of things that I would have said, but just to emphasise, I think, I want to come back in a moment to talk about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, which I think has been absolutely fundamental in the transformation of this debate. But in terms of peace and security issues, the first point I guess I would make is that uh, at the moment, I think there are nine countries with nuclear weapons. Um, if you think about the inevitable consequences of a free for all, in relation to nuclear weapons, which I think largely prevails at the moment, given the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty can be uh, exited with three months notice. The inevitable consequence of that must be, if not in our lifetimes, then certainly in the lifetimes of those who come after us, that the horizontal proliferation of nuclear weapons is going to increase dramatically. So instead of nine countries, you know, there'll be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so it will go on because those who don't have nuclear weapons uh, inevitably will be under pressure at one time or another, given changes of government to go down that route. So that's the first issue. It's a terrible threat to the stability of the world. And Melissa is right uh, in alluding to non-state actors. Um, can anyone guarantee in the world that we live in that non-state actors aren't going to come uh, to access nuclear materials and the potential to be able to um, create a dirty bomb or, or something even greater. Um, and that's a major threat, I think, to the peace and security of the world. Uh, Melissa's quite right. Governments change. You know, um, just think uh, what we've seen um, in relation to some countries that where we've had very close relations uh, fairly predictable um, stability, and all of a sudden it all changes. And that's the reality of the world we live in will, and will continue to live in. But when governments change, guess what? The key to those nuclear weapons is handed over to the, to the uh, unstable uh, government. Cyber attack, I think, is a very legitimate uh, threat, a very, a very worrying threat, I should, should, should make clear. Um, and of course, if there was a cyber attack that managed to access some of the systems, then uh, you can imagine the potential for uh, a nuclear war to be caused by uh, you know, a firing of a nuclear weapon or the, the threat to a system is great indeed. Um, the next threat to stability and security and peace 
is, of course, an accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon. You know, uh, the Americans would have us believe, and for probably good reason, that they are the most technological advanced nation on Earth, or one of them. But if you think that's a guarantee that accidents won't happen, uh, get a book by a guy called Eric Slosser called Command and Control that lists, lists dozens upon dozens of near misses in relation to the accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon. And he concludes that we've survived throughout all these decades, um, not by sophisticated uh, technology, but by dumb luck. So they're the things I would, would say are uh, enormous threats. But of course, uh, you, know, you can imagine, and we'll get to this in a moment, if a nuclear war occurs, even a limited nuclear war, what the consequences might be. We'll all be wise after that event, but it'll be too late. Should it happen? Yeah. Um, and I'll put a link to that book in the chat, actually. Um, Tim, did you, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I might just add that the uh, TPNW is based on uh, the deep concern of the international community at the consequences of nuclear weapons, um, you know, the, the effects of their use on people and, and the environment. Um, that's what motivated countries to negotiate it. Um, and there are a series of conferences in 2013 and 2014 um, that really looked in detail at what nuclear weapons do when they're used based on the uh, experience in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also looking at some of the impacts of the 2000 or so nuclear tests that have been conducted around the world, uh, including in Australia and the Pacific. And um, there are a whole range of UN agents, those discussions uh, that explained uh, the impact that uh, a nuclear weapon detonation anywhere in the world would have uh, on their work uh, in terms of the uh, devastation that it would cause to the health infrastructure, um, the inability to provide any kind of meaningful humanitarian response. That was also a message that the, that the Red Cross brought to those discussions. Uh, we had the refugee agency talking about the, the forced uh, displacement of millions of potentially millions of people in the aftermath of a, of a nuclear attack. Um, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization talked about the impact on uh, global agricultural production following a, a nuclear war where um, uh, so much soot is lofted into the upper atmosphere that uh, it results in a, um, a lessening of, of global rainfall and um, blocking uh, out of the sunlight and uh, all of these kind of um, consequences that hadn't previously been uh, discussed at the international level really provided a wake-up call for the international community and made it clear that uh, even if a particular country isn't likely to be itself the, the uh, subject of a, a nuclear attack, um, it very much has a security interest in ensuring um, that nuclear weapons are never used again, um, that this is a, a global problem, um, not just one for a small number of countries to deal with. And I'll just put in the chat there um, in a second, just an article by one of the ICANN co-founders that I think is surveys those public health impacts really effectively um, by Tillman Ruff, um, just in a moment, uh, in case people are interested in reading about the detail of what would happen if even a single uh, nuclear weapon was, was fired or mis misfired on, on a civilian target. Um, I, I guess going from this, I mean, we're getting into sort of the, the politics of the treaty. I'm interested in asking Mel, uh, you wrote once about the Turnbull government boycotting uh, treaty draft discussions back in 2017, citing Australia's reliance on what is sometimes referred to as the nuclear umbrella provided by our allies. Could you explain what the nuclear umbrella is as a concept and does it need to be a part of Australia's defence policy? Oh, sorry, you're on, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is a part of uh, Australia's official defence policy to be under the US nuclear umbrella. Um, and uh, I, um, I want to mention that um, 10 years ago on Australia Day 2012, uh, Tom Muren and former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser 
were among 800 Order of Australia recipients, including former governors general, uh, foreign affairs and defence ministers, premiers, governors, um, uh, high court judges and chiefs of the armed forces who called on the Australian government to adopt a nuclear weapons free defence posture and work towards a nuclear weapons convention. So this is not a bunch of bleeding heart lefties here. We're talking serious defence and uh, political people, um, very well aware of the consequences. Um, the truth is that while ever we allow our government to keep nuclear weapons in our defence doctrine and foreign affairs policy, we are legitimising weapons that are designed and intended to cause massive humanitarian harm. Um, in, a, in a climate of global ter um, tension, nuclear weapon states have insisted that their weapons are necessary as a deterrent to others. Uh, implicit in this is the assumption that mutually assured destruction will keep everyone safe. Uh, I think it's appropriate that MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, is the acronym because it is a kind of madness. Um, and it brings to mind for me the story of the scorpion and the frog. You know, the scorpion uh, wants to cross a river but can't swim, so it asks the frog, to give it a lift over to the other side. The, lift, the frog rightly says, well, hang on a minute, you're gonna sting me. Um, and the scorpion points out, uh, well, um, well, no, if I did that, I'd be dead too, because I'd drown. Um, and so, I, and the scorpion promises not to sting him. So the frog duly uh, takes the scorpion on its back, midway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog and it, as the frog's dying, it says, why? Why did you do this? You're going to drown too. And the scorpion says, well, it's in my nature. You know, um, mutually assured destruction doesn't mean that, the country, that, that nobody will fire a nuclear weapon. Um, the concept of nuclear deterrence requires rational behaviour uh, by all of those who control nuclear weapons. And do we really have confidence that every person in control of a nuclear weapon, just think North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, will they always behave rationally and not launching an attack on other nuclear um, states or their allies? Um, and not to mention, as, as was raised earlier, the risk of them falling into uh, non-state actors' hands. Um, the nuclear deterrence policy also also assumes that nuclear weapons make the world safer, not more dangerous. And patently the reverse is true. And Robert has set out very well the reasons why there are inherent risks in the production, testing and possession of nuclear weapons. And uh, I'll just add to, um, to, uh, to Robert's comment about the, um, the, the book on nuclear near misses. Uh, the comedian social commentator, John Oliver, has done um, some um, brilliant, brilliant summations of the folly of nuclear weapons, um, including the potential for nuclear devastation by incompetence or accident. So if you just Google uh, his YouTube clips on, on those, I think you'll find them very uh, enlightening as well as entertaining. Uh, Australia's former ambassador to the UN, um, Richard Butler, wrote that the notion that there will always be fail-safe systems and that those will be in the firm control of persons at the highest level of decision-making responsibility has proved to be unreliable. And our experience to date has been shaped as much by good fortune as good management. And I think we've heard that already from Tim and Robert as well. So um, yes, there is a nuclear, we're under the nuclear umbrella, but it is a false security. Yep. Yeah, did, did any other panelists want to jump in on that? I think that also goes to uh, Dominic's comment in the in the chat there about the justifications that are given falsely for this uh, this policy. Um, uh, Robert, I wanted to ask you uh, in your work for the Red Cross, you did a lot to highlight the humanitarian consequences that you gestured to before um, of the use of nuclear weapons um, on the people of the world. Could you give us a bit more about this dimension of the campaign that ICANN is also involved on and those kinds of humanitarian responses and what they reveal about 
the realities of a nuclear war? Sure. Um, look, the first thing I want to say is that um, a great privilege that I had in my life and a number of people in this webinar have also had it is to go to Hiroshima. And I have to tell you, for those who haven't been there, without question, this was for me the most profound, deeply moving event of my life because it brought home to me um, was someone who wasn't there at the time or didn't witness it from afar as Tommy Wren did, brought, to, brought home to me just what a nuclear weapon going off in a city or above a city involves. And, you know, it is a mass annihilation of a civilian population. Whatever military targets are taken out, it is a mass annihilation of a civilian population. And I cannot emphasize enough to, to all of you, whether you're activists or whether you are in a political party, in this case, the ALP, um, to really um, never forget the criticality of the humanitarian argument in this debate, because it is what actually transformed things. And um, Tim was quite right in talking about those humanitarian conferences. Do you know that in the entire history of the world, the very first international conference on the humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons uh, happened in Oslo in, um, in 2013, the very first conference because all the rest of it had been about you know great international power plays you know playing the diplomatic card the arguments about you know uh, uh, state power state authority protection etc and so on this humanitarian agenda completely undercut that and i want you you know i plead with you to think about the power of this argument as, as Tim has mentioned, but I really do want to reinforce. And that is that, you know, we've, we've had action around chemical and biological weapons and, and the outlaw of those weapons, going right back to the Mustard Gas and Poisons Convention of 1925, or the first Geneva Convention, which was about protecting civilians, uh, coming to the aid of those on the battlefield. You know, this is, this is all part of the history of evolving international humanitarian law. And they're inspirational things, you know, for the world to take a stand in relation, for example, to, to cluster munitions, um, or before that, um, landmines, to actually say, to stigmatize and outlaw the use of landmines and cluster munitions. Wow, what a step forward to the world. And of course, that stigmatization and the outlawing, if I use that word, um, is the catalyst for the world to get organizing, you know, to stop the production of the landmines, to start to address some of the tremendous harms that have occurred from their use over a great many years. And in relation to nuclear weapons, wouldn't it be absurd that any bleating hearted politician who talked about children in Syria or Yemen and the suffering of people all around the world who, who championed the outlawing of chemical and biological weapons, who said no, as the Liberal Party and National Party have, to their great credit, le showed leadership in relation to landmines. But it is untenable to hold those positions and yet say it's okay to use nu nuclear weapons and, and literally obliterate um, whole cities of civilian populations. So I just implore people to remember the power of that argument. And that's why the International Committee of the Red Cross, you know, who is so neutral, so impartial, has been so strong on this issue because nuclear weapons violate the most fundamental tenet of humanitarian values and principles. So the only other thing I'd say on this issue is that people really need to know that when a nuclear weapon goes off, you can forget the UN, you can forget the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, you can forget Oxfam, you can forget 
every global humanitarian organization and you can forget national governments. You know, when Hurricane Katrina hit in America, the great, you know, powerful United States of America, they couldn't respond to Hurricane Katrina. If a nuclear weapon goes off, civilian authorities and military authorities will be utterly incapable of rendering any minimum humanitarian assistance to the whole cities that are, that are impacted. Don't believe me, believe the International Red Cross, believe the UN, because uh, that's what they're saying. And, and that's why we've got such strong public support, because this humanitarian principle goes to the very essence of decency and principle and what it mean, means to be a human being. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we might move quickly to just some, some practicalities of how the treaty operates in Australia, which might benefit people talking to other Australians about it. Um, Tim, quickly, what are the, uh, the main sort of practical impacts that the treaty's operation in Australia will have? Um, well, one of the things we've already discussed is the nuclear umbrella. And one of the, the practical uh, implications of joining the treaty is that Australia would no longer be able to claim that it relies on US nuclear weapons for its defence. Um, that would be incompatible with the, the prohibitions in uh, Article 1 of the treaty. Uh, in particular, Australia can't, as a, if it were to join the treaty, Australia wouldn't be able to um, in, encourage in any way another country to possess or, or use nuclear weapons. Um, and so this doctrine of extended nuclear deterrence is fundamentally uh, incompatible with the treaty. Um, I think, I mean, to, to date, Australia has had quite a, an ambiguous uh, position on nuclear weapons. Um, it's, um, on the one hand, a state party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and so it's, it's, it has said that it will never acquire nuclear weapons itself, and, and that's the position also um, that it has uh, adopted through the uh, South Pacific nuclear weapon free nuclear free zone uh, treaty as well, um, and yet at the same time it has this this extended nuclear deterrence policy, um, and so joining the TPNW would would end that um, ambiguity and make it clear that um, Australia uh, opposes nuclear weapons categorically. Um, I hope that um, the treaty. Uh, Australia's accession to the treaty would also um, lead to some uh, tangible outcomes that uh, address ongoing harm to uh, communities as a result of the British nuclear tests that were conducted in Australia. Uh, under Article 6 of the treaty, um, a state party is required to uh, take steps to assist victims and to uh, towards the remediation of contaminated environments. Um, some steps uh, have already been taken uh, on these issues, but I think that the treaty would provide a framework for um, greater work uh, in those areas. Uh, and so that would be a, uh, something that we, um, as I can, would be uh, working on in, in the long term uh, alongside the Australian government to uh, ensure that it is implementing its obligations uh, under that provision. Um, joining the treaty uh, would put Australia, bring Australia into line with other countries in this region. Uh, almost all of the countries of Southeast Asia uh, and the Pacific have signed and, and, and or ratified the treaty. Um, New Zealand was one of the strongest uh, proponents during the negotiations. Um, uh, Indonesia is a strong supporter and, and um, is working to complete its ratification this year. Um, and it would, it would uh, reflect Australia's, uh, the, the wishes of the Australian people um, on this issue. Um, and I think it's really important that we have a principled foreign policy, um, that as an independent state, we can uh, adopt policies that are uh, at times different from those of the United States. Um, and that doesn't mean that the United States uh, is no longer uh, a friend or an ally. Um, it's, it's just that we're two uh, separate independent countries that have um, a different perspective on this issue. 
Um, and I, I think that um, that would be a, a very meaningful step for Australia to take. Thank you. Um, Mel, a couple of questions. I might combine them into sort of one, uh, given the timing. But I just want to ask you, you've got a lot of experience uh, with uh, sort of sort of international relations and diplomacy in your career and in your time in parliament. Um, could you just talk us through briefly what J. Scott is, what the committee that considers the treaties is, um, and what the process might look like for the TPNW? And, and going off what Tim said there as well, um, if there are any implications of the treaty on our relationship with the United States. Oh, right. Oh, that's a biggie. <laughs> uh, no, um, just in relation to the process of signing up to the treaty, um, to become a state party to the treaty, Australia has to sign and ratify it or accede to it. I'll just talk about signing and ratifying it for the purposes of, of simplicity. Um, um, all treaty actions have to be um, approved by the federal Executive Council, which is basically, um, essentially, it, it signs off on what Cabinet signs off on. So um, once the, 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 if the Cabinet approves the signing of the treaty, um, it can then be signed by Australia's representative, usually the Prime Minister or the Minister for Foreign Affairs, or it could be uh, Australia's ambassador to the United Nations, and it has to be done in person in New York. Um, but signature alone uh, has only limited legal effect. Basically, it, it, it signifies an intention to, to ratify the treaty. It, um, you only be fully bound by the treaty once it's ratified. Uh, following the signature, the treaty would then be tabled in both Houses of Parliament for consideration by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, or JSCOT. Um, and that process can take around, take up to six months. Um, the, the parliament, the, the, the government can, um, the, the, the committee can make a recommendation and the government uh, can adopt the recommendation or it can ignore the recommendation or reject it. Uh, but hopefully the committee would uh, recommend um, ratification um, and then the, um, that would then be done by the Prime Minister or um, Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, potentially at the, uh, the general UN General Assembly in September. Uh, I would hope that um, whatever the timing of the federal election this year, and obviously has to be at the latest by May, that uh, Australia would participate in the first um, meeting of state parties, which is scheduled for later this year. I don't think a specific date has been set yet. Um, Australia can participate in observer, as an observer. And then, uh, uh, please, I think, it, is it 90 days? I think Jem or Tim can confirm for me, 90 days that after ratification that it would then enter into force for Australia. Um, so that's the process in relation to um, impact on our alliance with the US to, to sign up to the treaty. Uh, I've long argued the need for a more... Um, independent foreign and defence policy for Australia, uh, but I'm not alone in that. Um, former Prime Minister Paul Keating, for example, has also argued along the same lines, um, saying that uh, very clearly on a number of occasions that Australia does not have an independent balanced foreign policy, that basically we have tag along rights with the US that uh, has led to uh, involvement in conflicts like Iraq, and uh, but that being said, he has he, he has emphasised that um, the the rock solid nature of Australia's relationship, friendship, alliance with the United States is such that um, uh, and that relationship under the under the governments uh, governments of either persuasion. Um, is, is so rock solid that we couldn't get rid of the Americans even if we wanted to. So uh, that's a very keating thing to say. But um, that friendship is, is really strong. That alliance is really strong. There's, there's nothing that's going to get in the way of that alliance, uh, even uh, signing up to this treaty. So I think um, in the end, uh, our security and the whole world's security can only be benefited 
um, by us signing up to the treaty and making uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons that much uh, closer. Beautiful. Um, I've just got one last last question. As also worth noting, um, as I've been mentioning in branch presentations, New Zealand maintains its relationship with the United States, despite also having ratified the treaty. Um, but I just wanted to ask um, Mel, Mel and Rob, if you if you want to jump in on this, um, that you're both veterans of, of the recent ALP caucus and its peculiarities uh, and the party structures. Most people here, I'm seeing a lot of names of branch secretaries and organisers, are familiar with the challenges of organising in our party particularly uh, around environmental and security policy. Is there any advice you have for how we keep the machine running in the interests of social justice and ambitious policy development uh, and, and can actually keep things sort of, sort of constructive and progressive? Well, I'll say something, um, but I'll say something to make clear. I, I um, am not an ALP member these days and haven't been since 1996. So I don't uh, obviously intrude in internal Labour Party things, but I would say something that I think might be of some value here in, in pointing out, first of all, that it is important that governments of whatever political persuasion uh, remain consistent with humanitarian standards and principles in uh, major issues that confront them. And in some cases, of course, we need to remember that um, neither side of politics has a monopoly on these things. And uh, it was, in fact, the coalition that supported the Landmines Convention um, when they were in opposition and when they came to government uh, and took a, uh, a stronger stand, I think it's fair to say, than the previous Labor government. Um, and I guess my um, very strong view is that you need, to, everyone needs to understand, as I think most people do, that to get change in Australia or anywhere in the world, you need to build coalitions for change. What happens inside the parliaments is critical. You can't do it without legislation or the role of a government in many cases, but it's a movement of citizens, whether it's in support of creating an NDIS or the power of the women's movement in giving rise to the Sex, to the Sex Discrimination Act, for example, um, right across the spectrum of uh, government and idealism and building a better Australia is always the movement of the people uh, in support of that of that change. So I guess I say that uh, people who are in a political party, and I encourage everyone to get engaged in the political process. Um, I just think I've done my bit, and now it's time for others. But I think also shouldn't you shouldn't see your role as just a political party member you need to engage with the wider with the wider uh, community and the final thing i'd say i guess is that there's actually time when you have to take a stand and i reread the statement issued on the 23rd of january last year by anthony albanese and penny wong and that was a statement walking, welcoming the entry into force of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And it said the, world, the ambition for a world free of nuclear weapons is one that Labor shares. Australia can and should lead international effort, efforts um, to rid the world of, of nuclear weapons. And it went on to say a number of other things. But that's inspirational stuff. You know, it gives people a lot of heart um, that a country like Australia, uh, collaborating with others, can really make a difference in the world. And um, you know, I guess that's what I would say. We've, we've got to we've got to keep believing um, that we can make a difference because the evidence shows that the power of the people can move mountains. That's beautiful. Um, just the last question from Mel. I, I might direct your attention to, and this is just asked on, on this question, you know, how do we make nuclear issues as important to members as climate change? Climate change is important, but it pales in comparison to what happens if a nuclear disaster happens. Did you have any advice for ALP members specifically? Well, look, I, I, I don't think I can top what Robert just said. Uh, that is 
that building coalitions within the parliament, within the within the community, um, that's the way to do it. And that's what ICANN's been really good at. And uh, within, the, I mean, Labor members can play a part, as Robert says, within the party, but what, within the wider community, we're all human. We all have a stake in this, you know. So this is this is why it's so important to stand up. That's beautiful. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, no, one, no one jump off just yet. In the last five minutes here, I'm just going to quickly give a, a very quick briefing on the campaign and what our next steps are, basically. Uh, so we haven't had that many opportunities in the last couple of years to meet as party members on these questions. So I might just very briefly direct everyone's attention. If you've got a, if you've got your phone open, I'm just going to share this screen uh, just so we can have a little look uh, together. Um, this doesn't have all of the branches that we've visited recently, but we've obviously been speaking to a lot of branch members recently about in the last, you know, three months or so, four months or so. Um, about this campaign to try and get more people aware of the kinds of issues uh, that Robert and Mel uh, and, and Tim have been discussing tonight. And you're all now much better equipped than previously to discuss the sort of details and controversies that um, uh, sometimes people raise. Uh, but we're really interested in continuing this kind of work. So I just wanted to sort of, and I'll, I'll, send, the, I'll send a follow-up email with all of this information in it to everyone who registered for tonight, including people who missed it with, with the recording and stuff. Uh, but the key details of what we need to do in the next few months is basically finding opportunities before the election, um, as well as after it, to continue escalating the motion that I can, you know, Labour Friends of the Nuclear Weapon Ban has put up and passed through more than 30 branches already um, around the country, um, which is available at that website there that I'll, I'll send a link to, the link tree we have. Um, it also contains attached to it as a briefing with a list of all the unions that have agreed to the to support the treaty um, with all of the details, all of the polling and a lot of the questions that were answered tonight. So it's a really good and we've also got on that uh, list reports from ICANN on, uh, you know, some detail on how it would operate in Australia and the kind of stuff we've talked about tonight for people with really specific questions. Um, that's all linked in that link tree there. So the number one thing is to download that motion, send it to your branch secretary and find, find five or 10 minutes to discuss at the end of branch meetings. I'm aware that the party has obviously sent out to everyone, you know, we're on campaign footing, uh, but the reality is there's always an election around the corner. There are elections every six months or so in every part of Australia. Um, politics doesn't stop and this issue certainly doesn't. So um, at most branches, I mean, I've been visiting branches even during this campaign period and almost every branch has five or 10 minutes to discuss you know, a current political issue. And, and the other thing about it as well, and I'll include all this in the email um, in terms of talking points and ways you can sort of get it up at the branch. It's something that's very energizing for branch members. It's something that reminds us why we support a Labour government and why, given it's already a platform commitment, um, why it's important that we elect this government in particular. After the events of today uh, in, in, in Ukraine, obviously, um, nuclear, the threat of nuclear war continues to be quite pressing in people's minds and the need for a labour movement that's united behind uh, the humanitarian and, and peace and justice and security reasons for this treaty um, remains very active and very serious. So, you know, it's a, it's a current issue. It's something that um, needs to be pressed forward with and it needs to be on the minds of labour MPs and cabinet obviously in the event of a labour government. So downloading that motion. And then the second thing is just to tell us that you're doing it. And I'll send you an email with all this, but you can just email me there. You can call me. Um, I, I got a lot of interest in the lead up to tonight about the motion. A lot of people are only just hearing about it for the first time, uh, which is really exciting that we've reached those people. But just tell us that you're doing it so that we can support you. We have potential speakers all around the country. We're joined from people from almost every state and territory in the country tonight, yeah, even just on from, from people on the Zoom. Uh, and so it's a really good opportunity to sort of get this distributed across different state and territory branches that don't always talk to each other. And then, of course, what we'll get to do, hopefully in the next year or so, in the event of a Labour victory, certainly, um, is ban nuclear weapons, which is what we're all here to do, um, and make the world uh, that much safer and make nuclear weapons that much more stigmatised and commence, as Tim said, um, the longer work of destigmatizing, of stigmatizing and um, creating a new international norm uh, around the use and threat of nuclear weapons. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to, I'll stop sharing that now. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming again and particularly our wonderful panelists. Uh, I've learned uh, so much myself tonight just from the detail that everyone has provided. Uh, we're joined by people who have just extraordinary experience in the party, in the parliament, 
uh, and in international relations. And I think it's been a real pleasure for everyone to hear from you. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll send out an email to everyone with all of those details that I've gestured towards, uh, but I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks so Bye, much. Everybody. Bye, Bye. Thanks, Lachlan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lachlan. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you ICANN. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>